So Nicola Cesabianchi is professor of computer science at the University of Milan in Italy. He served as president of the Association for Computational Learning and co-chaired the program committees of some of the most important machine learning conferences. He is an ELIS fellow and co-director of the ELIS program of interactive um, and interventional re uh, representations. His main research interests are the design and analysis of machine learning algorithms for statistical and online learning, multi-arm bandits problems, and uh, graph analysis, analytics. On these topics, he published over 140 papers. Uh, he's known for his excellent lectures and talks, and today we have the pleasure of hearing from him on the topics of uh, online learning and bandits. And this evening, he will also be joining us for the fireside chat. But for now, um, let, I'm excited to hear uh, the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martina, for the very nice uh, introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be giving a talk in uh, my hometown, <laughs> although uh, unfortunately, this is uh, now a virtual experience. And uh, so I'm surprisingly, uh, for, uh, maybe for Martina who saw me already, uh, I will be talking of some uh, online learning and bandits and extra stuff. And uh, this is um, a topic that I've been uh, pursuing for uh, quite uh, uh, a few years now. And uh, it's, but um, it's still a, a, a very uh, nice topic that actually, um, you know, um, grew uh, bigger and bigger over the years uh, because uh, of uh, the, um, you know, the, the range of applications uh, of this uh, family of algorithms, of learning algorithms that is uh, um, ever increasing over the years. So um, uh, online learning, uh, uh, let me introduce, uh, you know, let me start with a few words on online learning in general. It's um, a learning paradigm that has been designed in order to learn from data streams. Uh, and the data streams uh, nowadays are pretty ubiquitous because of, uh, you know, several scenarios in which, we, because learning, uh, machine learning has, been, has become, you know, a, a standard tool in, in, in industry. And, uh, and, and the data streams uh, are, you know, are, something that arises pretty often in, in many contexts like, uh, you know, financial markets or sensor networks or um, user interacting on uh, uh, apps and websites. And um, so uh, the, the, the idea is that uh, new data is being generated all the time. So it's, it's you know, can be a pretty non stationary and, uh, um, and uh, um, you know, hardly, uh, it, it can be hardly uh, modeled using uh, standard statistical assumptions like IID assumptions, because, because it evolves with time in ways that uh, are often, uh, you know, highly unstationary. So um, in, uh, in this case, uh, the, what we are used to in uh, statistical learning uh, the so-called train test paradigm, you know, I collect a, a bunch of uh, data, I, I train the learning algorithm on this data, and then I test it to measure performance. And then at some point I deploy the algorithm in, uh, um, I deploy it on, in the field and uh, it runs, you know, um, in this case uh, it's, you know, it's, it can be, of course it can be applied you can collect data from the streams. But uh, then, uh, you know, after a while you may decide, okay, I would like to retrain the algorithm. And then you are in a, in a bit of a, of a difficulty because you would have to, you know, again, throw away the model that you had trained before, collect new data, train, it, train from scratch and start over. And this is not very nice. What you really would like to do is that you would like to incrementally update your, your model maybe even after uh, each uh, new data point comes in. So you make a small adjustment, possibly in constant time, and uh, therefore your model is uh, able to track uh, the evolution of the data stream. 
and to you know sustain a good performance throughout and um, you know there are several variations of that you may assume that you don't exactly want to update every, every after every single data point but for the moment we will assume that uh, you do it so all the all of the um, uh, all the examples I will give is exactly models in which you are allowed to make an update after each data point you observe. Okay. Feel free to interrupt me um, if you have uh, questions. We, I will leave some time at the end, hopefully. Um, I will stop early <laughs> to leave some time at the end for questions, but if you have questions in between, feel free to interrupt me. So this, uh, let me give you some history bits also to make a representation a bit, a bit lighter. So uh, this online learning, uh, online learning model was formalized uh, in the ninth, uh, late 80s, early 90s by uh, people like Nick Littlestone and Manfred Wormont. So Nick Littlestone is the bearded guy in uh, the first uh, picture in the left uh, with, with a straw hat. He is uh, quite uh, an interesting uh, person. He is a mathematician and uh, together with Manfred Wormont, uh, essentially single-handed uh, came up with uh, a, a theory of online learning and some amazing algorithms that are still used. And I will uh, let you know to guess uh, who are the two people at, at, the, at the side of both sides of Nick. And uh, uh, Manfred is the second, uh, second person over there. And uh, uh, the third person in the picture is Volodya Volk, who uh, independently developed a, a related framework uh, uh, in uh, which is, was called uh, aggregating strategies. But however, um, ideas are similar to online learning, al although in, uh, in different uh, uh, mathematical communities uh, uh, emerged uh, uh, in the pretty much around the same time in game theory and information theory and under different names. And uh, by now we have sort of a reconciled all these different perspectives uh, and have uh, a nice unified view with the many, uh, uh, you know, interesting uh, connections going on. So um, let me, you know, define this online learning protocol in a, in a more formal way. So you have uh, like a, a bag of models uh, a script H, uh, which your online algorithm will uh, Take models from, we'll pick models from, and this could be a pretty large uh, bag. It could be, you know, could contain uh, all uh, um, all linear uh, models uh, with coefficients bounded in some norm, for instance. And you start with some uh, initial the default model H1, and then your the you you start getting the data stream. And uh, every time uh, you get uh, uh, the next data point, you are testing uh, the current model on this uh, next data point. And uh, then we will uh, measure some loss uh, according to some uh, def you know, predefined, uh, uh, user-defined notion of loss. For instance, uh, if you like a square loss or classification loss or uh, log loss, any other loss you may be interested uh, with. And, uh, Oh, one, uh, one thing we ask is that uh, this loss will be convex in the model parameters. I will be more precise uh, in a while. So there are some restrictions on the loss. And, uh, and then you can, up, uh, based on the current model, the uh, current data point and the loss you suffered, that you may update uh, the model you know, to, uh, uh, to test it on the next incoming data points. So what you're actually doing is uh, you are generating a sequence of models uh, as uh, the uh, data stream is unfolding, um, uh, you know, um, in front of you. And uh, you know, it is important to understand that the computation of every next model in um, in this paradigm it relies on local information, which is the the current model and the, and the current data point. Okay, so it's a, it's a more a paradigm of, of local optimization as opposed to a paradigm of uh, global optimization, which is more typical for uh, statistical learning. Okay, and uh, one thing we uh, enjoy here is that uh, a typical analysis, online learning analysis, do not need uh, stochastic assumptions on the, generation of the, on the generation of the stream, so they are uh, uh, game theoretic in nature. 
In other words, the string can be generated by a completely arbitrary deterministic mechanism, even adversarial, but the uh, mathematical guarantees on the performance of the algorithm will still uh, hold. So this is quite uh, amazing and unique to the paradigm. And it is also the key to achieve a, a strong adaptation of the data. So basically the, uh, the algorithm is uh, able to, uh, in order to have this uh, performance guarantees uh, irrespective to the, to, the, to the way the stream is generated, he has to be able to uh, adapt uh, uh, pretty uh, in, in a pretty um, um, uh, flexible way to, to the data stream. Okay, um, so let me, um, so any, I hope you are all, this is pretty gen generic. And um, um, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll be concrete in a, more concrete in a minute. So we'll, uh, We'll take this uh, paradigm and we will apply it to, to a concrete case, which is the case of experts and bandits. And then we will, uh, after the last part of the talk, we will zoom out again and consider the general paradigm. So um, how do you measure uh, the performance? You, you don't have a notion of risk because there is no uh, probability here. There might be a randomization in, the, in internal in the algorithm and there's no probability in the environment. So uh, the notion you define is that you take advantage of the fact that you are not, uh, you don't have at the end of the day a single model, but you actually have an ensemble of models that you have generated as you ran the algorithm through the data uh, from, from the stream. So given a convex loss, I already mentioned that the loss has to be convex, I will be more precise in, 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 in which sense convex, in what, what parameters. And a, a, a stream, uh, the sequential risk of an algorithm, which is generated a sequence of the models, is defined as the sum of the losses suffered by each current model on the next point in the data stream. So I'm, I'm keeping on. I, I, you know, I keep on testing my current model on the on the data stream, and I'm collecting the losses and I'm summing it up. And I'm hoping this uh, sums doesn't grow too quickly. Okay, so now I can uh, I define a notion of regret, which is the, st the standard benchmark for online algorithms. So the regret is uh, the difference between uh, the cumulative loss of uh, the sequence of models that I uh, that my algorithm has generated, uh, you know, in the first uh, t uh, uh, elements of the stream. And this uh, notion of regret is parameterized by this capital T, which is the horizon. And the uh, loss, uh, cumulative loss on the same stream that the best model in my model class has suffered, could have suffered if I had played that fixed best model throughout the stream. Okay, so um, notice that uh, uh, this is a, uh, is, similar to the notion of a variance uh, error in, in statistical learning, because I'm comparing uh, the, the loss of my algorithm to the loss of the best model in the class that I am uh, my benchmark class. However, it's a bit different because there's, again, there's no probability. And the model that I am uh, uh, testing is not a single model, but is actually an ensemble of models. Okay. So, uh, and, and also, uh, pay attention to the fact that the infimum over the class uh, is uh, depends on time. So I'm actually competing against a moving target because as I increase capital T, that infimum might, might be uh, attained at the different points in my model class. All right, so uh, again, uh, so what are we interested in here? So one, one typical assumption we'll make uh, that uh, our loss is bounded Okay, this is some typical sanction because might have a, a bounded domains for instances and labels, for instance, if I'm in a regression setting. And, uh, and therefore, um, right, uh, therefore, you know, the worst I, I, I could have in case of bounded losses is that this regret grows linearly with time. Okay, so instead, what I would like to do uh, in order to, uh, and, you know, to have some learning is that uh, I would like to ensure that uh, the, um, 
average regret, so the regret divided by time, uh, goes to zero, irrespective to the stream. So this means basically that my average cumulative loss is converging to the average cumulative loss of the, the best model in the class, uh, irrespective to, to the way the stream is generated, provided the loss is convex and bounded. Okay, and some, some other assumptions I will make uh, clear later. But there won't be any assumption on, on uh, any statistical assumption on the stream. Okay, so right, uh, this uh, online learning, as I said, this idea of online learning, yeah, learning over a stream uh, has uh, um, come up in uh, different contexts. For instance, uh, um, uh, in, in game theory, people look at uh, the idea of uh, playing a game repeatedly uh, against uh, some, uh, um, you know, some opponent. Uh, in our case, uh, we could uh, uh, view the opponent as a data stream. So the opponent is throwing a data that does, and we are trying to predict them as bad as, 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 as good as possible. And uh, the, you know, this opponent can be actually uh, not definite, maybe it's not completely adversarial, maybe it's completely indifferent to us or oblivious, or maybe it's even benign. And we would like uh, the algorithm to sort of a, uh, um, exploit uh, uh, circumstances in which you know, your data stream is actually easy to learn. Okay. So uh, in the following, uh, we will view the data stream. So we will find it uh, you know, more convenient to, to uh, absorb the data point inside of the loss function. So we will index the loss function by a time and you can think of it as a fixed loss function, uh, which is parameterized by the data point. Okay, and we apply it, uh, and the argument we apply it is, is the model, uh, which we typically will be a linear model. Okay, so let me now zoom in in a specific case, which is this uh, experts bandit framework that I will uh, dwell upon for, for a while. So uh, in this case, um, my, my models are probability distributions, okay? Because uh, uh, I, 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 so you can think of them as linear models that are, you know, vectors that are taken from the simplex, from the probability simplex, okay? And my loss will be uh, linear, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, still convex. So I have a linear, I have a, um, a model, which is a linear model, and I have a linear loss, and my uh, my I can view now my linear loss as uh, the expectation of uh, my uh, of the loss given the current model, which is a probability distribution. So I, I can imagine I have now I I draw a coordinate from my uh, uh, from my. Uh, in my simplex, in my d-dimensional space, I draw the coordinate according to the probability distribution as you see here. And then my linear loss, where LT is a vector of coefficients is just the expectation of that. Okay, so, okay, okay. This is now an example, that's fine. It's a linear loss uh, and uh, my models are elements from the simplex. Uh, and uh, I am assuming that the coefficients of this loss vector are bounded between zero and one. So let me now reformulate this in a more meaningful and more inter interpretable way. I have a sequential, this is called prediction with expert advice and it corresponds exactly to this uh, special case of uh, online learning. So I have D actions and you can think of them as uh, like uh, D for instance, uh, stocks uh, in your uh, stock market, if you like. And uh, I have some uh, determ unknown deterministic assignment of losses to actions, which is my linear loss. And you can view these coefficients and you can think of, you know, how much will I lose or gain? You can, uh, uh, you know, shift around. If you assume that everything is bounded, you can uh, shift it around and assume that now we are talking about losses which are negative gains, if, if, you, if you like. We'll be talking about losses, although in some examples is uh, more convenient to, to think of the words. But again, is I just can just flip the sign and everything will... Uh, Define, and uh, these are bounded between zero and one. And what I do at every time step, I you know I will uh, pick some action, and uh, I will typically use randomization, which will uh, corresponds to my model in the simplex. So as a, a probability, as a, a some probability over the actions, 
and I will incur the loss associated with the action I chose. So for instance, I will chose a specific stock and the stock will have some uh, variation over a day. And I will, uh, you know, I will have some, uh, some uh, uh, my, my money will be gained or lost according to the, to the variation, okay? And we always assume now that we're talking about losses again. So, uh, and, uh, and then I can see how the other stocks performed on the same day. And so I know how much I would have won or lost if uh, had I played a different, uh, had I invested in a different stock. Okay. So this is like the paradigm with par uh, prediction with expert advice. I have these uh, actions correspond to experts. I sort of uh, uh, follow the advice of a certain expert. So I, I, I possibly using randomization. And then I have some loss that is the loss of that expert. And then I observe what have, would have happened and, had I done a different uh, thing, okay? So now you, you can uh, view um, the notion of regret we saw before, okay? Now we compete against the, our mother class is all the probability distribution over the D actions. And now we can rewrite it in the following way, okay? Since we are minimizing a linear loss over, this, over the simplex, uh, this uh, minimization will always be attained at the corner. So we are actually, uh, this minimum, it means that we are competing against the, the best action in our set of the actions, or if you like, the best uh, coordinate of the, of the simplex, okay? And uh, this is just uh, the sum of the expected losses that we incur uh, as we draw our action from uh, the uh, current uh, model, which is a probability distribution of an action. So I will uh, evolve this probability distribution over time as I'm observing the, uh, the loss vectors that corresponds to the, uh, the prices of the stock, if you like, okay? So now this is something, uh, okay, I am, uh, you know, I, I have to pick uh, actions over time or I have to pick experts. Uh, each expert has some loss assigned to it. And I, uh, the, my, my loss is the loss of the expert I pick every day. And then competing with the, the cumulative loss of the single best expert over that same sequence of uh, uh, losses. Okay. Okay. So now this is a, a, a very uh, you know concrete problem, very simple, very crisp. I just uh, don't know anything about the sequence of uh, uh, losses, and uh, I I you know everything is bounded. So the, the most I can uh, suffer is linear regret. And uh, I can use, uh, of course, this is a deterministic problem, but I can still prove a lower bound using a statistical learning. And if I prove, if I use a statistical learning on uh, a randomly generated losses, I can observe that uh, uh, any algorithm will have to suffer a regret which grows as a square root of uh, uh, time and the log of the number of experts, okay? This is a, a asymptotic lower bound for both the DAT going to infinity. So now I'm interested in, uh, I can, in whether I can match or not with some, uh, you know, some easy algorithm, these lower bounds. And amazingly enough, there is a, an algorithm that has been discovered over and over in, uh, over the, in, in different areas that uh, will do this job uh, very, very neatly up to constants. So this is called the exponentially weighted forecaster or hedge. And the forecaster, you know, all you have to specify in this problem is how do I pick these probability distributions? And the, and the, and the theory says, this, uh, sorry, this forecaster says that you should pick, uh, TMT you should pick an action I with the probability proportional to E to the minus the uh, historical loss of that action up to that point, okay? So this is summed over from one to T minus one losses of action I in the past. I observe these losses so I can keep track of the losses of every action in the past. And this is a learning rate. Okay, so basically this is a, is a sort of a soft max thing if you are familiar with that, but I'm not putting an average in my exponent. I'm really putting a, a sum. So now what happens, uh, my, uh, 
One can prove if I tune my learning rate as follows, I get uh, an upper bound on the regret, and the proof is not too long, but I don't have, to have time to show it, which is exactly matches the lower bound, including constants, and is not asymptotical. So this is a quite amazing uh, that uh, a, a, such a simple algorithm uh, on, uh, on a problem which is completely you know, deterministic without any stochasticity is able to match the stochastic lower bound without having any, without just using internal randomization. Okay. And uh, so this is nice. It's tell you that uh, you have a very mild dependence on the number of experts, on the number of stocks. And you have a square root dependence, uh, which is the best you can have on time. Okay, so now let's move a little bit uh, to a, 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 a more difficult game, which is has a, a lot of practical applications. This is the bandit problem. And the, the bandit problem is exactly as the express problem. However, the difference is that uh, after I picked my action, I only observe <clears throat> the loss of uh, the action I picked. Uh, the loss of the remaining actions uh, remain uh, hidden forever. Okay, so this is tricky because now I cannot run any more this algorithm because I cannot keep track of these losses because I only saw the losses of actions I pick. So how do I do that? Okay, how can I um, do this? Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, tell you that this uh, problem has lots of uh, applications like uh, Add placement uh, because, uh, or dynamic contact layout opti optimization in websites, because every time I show the user an ad, uh, the user will give me feedback on the ad I showed, uh, but uh, I will know the feedback of the user on the ads that I didn't show to him or her. And uh, auctions are also, um, you know, the same kind of phenomenon because, uh, you know, I can post, a, I can sell an item to a certain price, I will have to see the reaction of. Uh, the buyers to that price. Recommender systems, of course, you can figure it out. Clinical trials, I can give a certain drug to a patient and we'll know, I will see uh, the reaction of the patient to the drug I gave it to him or her and many others. Okay, so now I would like to solve this problem using the same machinery, but uh, I will solve it in a slightly more general framework, which is actually a, a sort of interpolation between experts and, and bandits. So you can actually imagine that, uh, you know, in general, maybe you have a graph over actions and whenever you pick an action, you observe the loss of the action that you picked and uh, we, you will pay that loss. So we'll pay the action of the green thing, but you will be also able to observe the losses of the action in the neighborhood of those in the graph, okay? So you pay this one, but you observe everything in the neighborhood of the action you picked. So uh, why? Because, you know, actions, you, you might have some kind of similarity over actions. So uh, there might be a similarity graph. For instance, you have a recommendation problem and you have a similarity graph over, pro over products. So if you recommend this product to a user, you might infer the reaction of the user to products that are somehow related to it. Okay, so you can infer the loss of the users on things, on certain number of things that you didn't show to him or her. Okay, so now you see that in the case of the experts, your graph is a click because every time you play an action, you see every, every, uh, the loss of all the others. And the bandits is just uh, the edge, it's just a graph without any edge because you only observe the action that you actually recommend to the user. All right, so you have this uh, thing of similarity and which is also, Okay, I won't comment on this in the interest of time. So now how can I run the same algorithm as before in this more general setting? Now, you see, I cannot keep track of the losses of all the algorithms. So I have to use the loss estimates. And because I, I can only observe losses when they are in the neighborhood of, when the action is, then, is in the neighborhood of the action I picked at that time step. So what I use now is a loss estimate, which is, uh, uh, is called importance weighted loss estimate. And the idea is that my loss estimate will be zero if I don't observe for time t, if I don't observe the loss at time t for that action, 
if I do observe the loss of, of, of attempt of this action because it was in the neighborhood of the loss that I played at the time, or was even the same loss I played at the time, then I, uh, my loss estimate will be uh, the loss I observed divided by the probability of observing it, which I know because I know the probability with which I extract the actions. Okay, so by dividing the probability, I make the loss bigger which compensates for the, from the, for the fact that I make it a small zero whenever I don't observe it. Remember that losses are between, are at uh, not, uh, don't go below zero. So it's pretty easy to see. There's a very easy computation that uh, this is an unbiased uh, loss estimator. Okay, so if I take the expectation with respect to the probability of uh, drawing uh, the actions, I get uh, exactly the, the thing I want to estimate, which is the loss at MT of action I. And the variance is bounded by the loss squared, which is, uh, uh, you know, losses are bounded between zero and one, divided by the probability of, obs of observing the, the loss of that action. Okay, so unbiased. Uh, estimator with bounded variance, we can do a lot of it. So we can uh, uh, analyze uh, the uh, hedge algorithm, which was the exponential weight algorithm that I saw before on uh, this uh, more general problem. And uh, uh, one thing will come up is the notion of independent set of uh, the observability graph of the, over the actions. So this is the largest uh, subset of vertices that are pairwise non-adjacent. Okay, and it's a, a standard notion in graph theory. So this is how the regret bound looks before tuning for eta and uh, uh, magically pops up uh, this uh, independence number of the observability graph. If I tune eta accordingly, I get this bound, which looks very much like what I had before. And this bound is tight for all given observability graphs up to logarithmic factors. And the special cases are okay. In the case of a click, the independence number is one. I recover the experts bound I had before. And in the case of the bandits, the independence number is just uh, the number of vertices because I have no edges with any, any subset of vertices is independent. And then I have this uh, regret bound, which is, oh, which is optimal for the, um, in the bandit case. So you see in the bandit case, I have an additional dependence, which is, uh, 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 like a square root of D uh, in the number of actions. And this is the price I pay because I only observe in the bandit case, one single action. I observe only observe the loss of the action I picked. Okay. But in, I have a general result that interpolates uh, between uh, the information I get, uh, the full information I get in the experts case and the uh, partial information I get in the bandits case. And I have a full, uh, 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 full interpolation here. Okay, everything is tight here. And this is something that is uh, 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 nice because it shows that the, the, how much the amount of feedback that you receive from the problem is going to affect your performance in, in a very tight and precise way. Okay, nice, cool. Uh, 9.34, let me go back to the general problem. Now I have, a, you know, I've solved a special case uh, and I also showed you some uh, how to deal with partial information. So let me jump back to the general case. This is the, uh, the same slide I showed you for the online convex optimization problem, uh, the online learning problem, which I would like now to phrase an online convex optimization, which will be our general framework for online learning. So my model space now is a, a, a subset of parameters in, in the real uh, d-dimensional space, which is convex, closed, and non-empty. And uh, now I am using uh, linear models, okay, and the uh, convex loss functions. So I'm uh, making more precise. My models are going to be uh, linear and uh, so uh, vectors of uh, coefficients. And I have uh, some convex loss functions, uh, which will be applied to that. So it could be, you know, linear regression with square loss, if you like, or uh, it could be a binary classification with hinge loss, or it could be, uh, you know, logistic, uh, linear classification with logistic uh, loss function, you know, many, many things. Now, the algorithm is charged as, as before with the loss, which is now convex in my uh, in my parameters, in the parameters of the model. 
and uh, now I typically assume in uh, on the examples that uh, the feedback I receive uh, is uh, the gradient uh, of uh, um, and the loss on the on the current model at late. Okay, and uh, this is a, a typical assumption we do in in optimization, and we carry it on over uh, in uh, this uh, online convex optimization setting. We can use a different, uh, more powerful oracle like a second order oracle or others. But uh, for the moment, we will stick to this first order oracle because it's the cheapest one we can have. Okay. So, in, okay, in the case of uh, linear losses, uh, the gradient is, is exactly the vector of coefficients of the linear loss. So we are back in the uh, experts case in the case of linear losses. And the regret is measured as before. And I will typically try to compete with the best model in the, in the class. Okay, cool. So why is this important? Because, uh, okay, I said that I applied this to streams, but I can apply that to do also standard learning. Suppose that I have a huge data set. This is our old little faces, so you can see them. I have a huge data set, so I cannot really do uh, um, on a, a standard or global optimization because it's too big. And uh, you know, it's cheaper to run a stochastic gradient descent. And I, you guys know that I have many advantages uh, if I run a stochastic gradient descent. Uh, because I can use the stochasticity to es uh, escape from local minima if my loss is not convex and so on and so forth. So if I have to minimize a training error of a large uh, training set, I can use uh, uh, a stochastic gradient descent, which is just uh, online learning uh, on a stream, which is uh, uh, generated by drawing uh, uh, um, training points IAB from the training set. So I generate a stream, which is actually an IID stream, but my algorithm will be able, of course, because it can face any, it can cope with any stream, will be able to work on it. And I can use additional assumption in order to sharpen my analysis. So I can convert a regret bound in, uh, on a convergence bound uh, in, uh, in a, sorry, in a convergence rate uh, to the minimization of the training error. And if the training loss is convex, uh, then it will be, you know, I will converge it to a global minimum. Otherwise, I will converge it to a, a you know, a, a different point uh, in the in the error uh, in, in the error landscape according to the, the assumptions I have. But this is some a typical application I can do of, of online learning, and you know, many online learning algorithms like Adagrad are being uh, uh, used to perform stochastic optimization. Um, okay. Right, so uh, we can also prove lower bounds uh, as just we proved for the expert case. And again, I will have this uh, dependence of square root of t. I had it, had it already in a special case. I will also have it in a general case. And now I can see that uh, if I measure uh, d is the Euclidean diameter of my model space and my losses have uh, Euclidean norm which is of the order of uh, G, then uh, any algorithm in this online convex optimization uh, setting is bound uh, to suffer regret that grow, which grows like that, okay? If I measure things according in the following, according to Euclidean distance, and I have these numbers here. Okay, um, so now you, we can, uh, uh, see a few things, right? So suppose now that I have loss, uh, the loss, my loss is linear, I have bounded coefficients and gradients, I have Euclidean norm, uh, square root of D, because they are fat gradients uh, with, uh, you know, with these uh, uh, bounded coefficients. And uh, if uh, my model space is the unit Euclidean ball, then the previous lower bound suggests that I should suffer a loss like that. But if I change my model space, I take the probability simplex, then I know that hedge has a, a different dependence on the, the dimension. It's not the square root of D, but it's square root of a land D. So there's something here that is going on and depends on the geometry of my model space that somehow uh, the algorithm, uh, some algorithms are able to exploit. So this is what I would like to, to, to you know, to, uh, in the remaining time. So let's uh, now see where all these, um, you know, well, hold this. Let me now introduce a family of algorithms, which is used in, uh, in online learning, in online convex optimization. So we start from gradient descent. 
uh, in optimization. So I have just a, a single uh, convex function I would like to optimize with gradient descent and I project in my model space uh, W. So I do the argmin of, uh, uh, you know, minimize the gradient and I have the, the projection here. And this is my learning rate. So this is standard projected gradient descent. Okay, just written in a variational form. So what I can do here now is that I can say, okay, if I'm in an online setting now, I don't have a single function to optimize, I have a sequence of function. So I can just take my uh, standard gradient descent and rewrite it with, by replacing the, the fixed function with the, the gradient of the current function. And now I can say, okay, actually I can maybe be more general and instead of you know, using Euclidean distance to measure distances in my model space, I can use a generalized notion of distance, which I call Bregman divergence, which you can think of as a generalized square distance. And, uh, uh, and this is a, a distance which is parameterized by a strongly convex, a strictly convex a differentiable function, which is called the mirror map. Okay, so it's a function that generates a family of distances that contains a square Euclidean as a special case. And this is the definition of the Bregman divergence, you know, in terms of this mirror map. And you can recognize this as the error of first order Taylor expansion of the strictly convex psi around the point W. Okay, so this is a way of generating a family of distances which I can use to do a gradient descent uh, in a certain model space and uh, on a, a sequence of uh, time varying loss functions as in, uh, in online convex optimization. So I can take this algorithm and uh, write, uh, if I take uh, the square Euclidean norm as, uh, uh, as a mirror map, then I get the square Euclidean distance and I'm, I'm back to an algorithm which performs uh, online gradient descent with the Euclidean projection. If I use uh, the negative entropy as a mirror map, I end up with a way of measuring distances, which is just a relative entropy. And uh, uh, this uh, general algorithm, which is called online mirror descent, the algorithm that I showed you before here, becomes uh, exponentiated gradient algorithm, which has a special case of linear losses you see here, so the algorithm is this, because I, I, changed the, um, I changed the mirror map, I got a different notion of distance, I solved the variational problem here, which is a, a linear term and a convex term, so I can do it, because this is always convex in the first argument, and I end up with this solution here. Oh, why? So, okay, what is that? Okay, this is, is, if losses are linear, so gradients are just loss coefficients, and I end up Again, with the exponentiated gradient algorithm, sorry, the exponentiated the uh, hedge algorithm I use it for experts. So as you see now, this is a broad family of uh, online algorithms that contains uh, my experts and bandits if I use loss estimates and uh, online gradient descent as both as special cases. Why is this interesting? Because now, okay, now I can, uh, prove a regret bound for a time varying learning rate. And the regret bound will, uh, uh, will have this form where this is the a diameter of uh, the model space with this, uh, my uh, V somewhere was here, is the diameter of V in the distance, in the specific distance measure I'm using, which is the Bregman divergence, which could be uh, which is, you know, the relative entropy or the Euclidean distance or any other distance called, uh, depending on the background. Okay. And uh, GR is the norm of the gradients of the loss and the norm is measured according to a special norm which is linked to, uh, to the, uh, to the Bregman divergence. Okay. So I now can use, I can do uh, the tuning according to this gradient, which I observe typically. And I end up with a bound, which is, has this form. And uh, it will, will depend uh, on the squared norm of the gradients. It will depend on the diameter and we depend on the square root of time. Okay, so you are, uh, you are looking at something that we, we saw already in our lower bound and uh, it also in other, um, and, and you can recognize also in the bounds that we had for uh, uh, the other algorithms. So I have a general lower uh, uh, regret bound that holds for any online algorithm. 
So now I can, uh, you know, match the mirror map to the geometry of the model space. So if I have uh, bounded gradient components, uh, if my model space is a Euclidean ball or unit radius, I can use, uh, I can, uh, a good choice for Bregman divergence is the square Euclidean distance. And I end up with the bound of this form. So I, my online mirror descent becomes online gradient descent. So I'm just, just using a gradient, standard gradient descent. And I have a, a regret bound of this form, which is optimal for this setting. If I have an uh, um, exponentiated gradient, which is uh, uh, the uh, hedge algorithm for experts uh, with arbitrary convex losses, then uh, I will use the probability simplex as model space. And I will measure distances using the relative entropy, which is the right measure for the uh, probability simplex. And my bound, uh, my regret bound will take this form, which is again optimal for this uh, setting here. Okay. So you see, according to the geometry of my model space, which, is, uh, which depends on the problem, I have a, a natural way of measuring distances. If I have Euclidean ball, I use Euclidean distance. I have a simplex, I use relative entropy. And uh, the mirror descent algorithm will adapt to the geometry of uh, the problem and will deliver, in many cases, the optimal bound. Okay? Okay, so this is the main messages message I wanted to give you here. I have a flexible, flexible tool, which I can adapt to the geometry of the problem and uh, through the choice of the mirror map. Okay. And uh, the algorithm is uh, uh, often easy to implement. For instance, in this case, uh, the projection on the simplex is just normalization. In this case, I have a, a you know, Euclidean projection if I have a more uh, exotic uh, like uh, uh, mirror map uh, and corresponding Bergman divergence, the projection could be a tricky business. But in general, in, in this uh, uh, remarkable special case, it's easy. And, uh, in, uh, and this is a very flexible tool because I can deal with the, the case in which gradients are only uh, maybe are stochastic uh, depending on some partial feedback, like in this case. So in this case, I, uh, you know, the uh, bandit case is just uh, running exponentiated gradient in the simplex with linear losses and uh, a gradient estimate. Okay, because I don't have access to the entire gradient. I only have access to maybe a few components of the gradient. So I have to estimate the rest, but I can use these nice tricks and again, get a, a bounce on the regret. Okay, then I have a few more things uh, to say. Uh, of course, I can exploit the curvature of the loss. Uh, if my losses uh, are convex, I know anything about them, and mo anything more about them, I, the typical learning rate I will use is one over square root of time. And this will deliver a regret, which is optimal for the case of convex losses and will be tight if losses are linear. If I, I know that uh, my losses are strongly convex, uh, then I can afford a faster learning rate, uh, a learning rate vanishing uh, much faster. And I get a regret, uh, which is exponentially better. So it depends on uh, logarithmically with time. And I can even uh, compete again against model classes that are not bounded. So I don't need, don't have to use a projection. I can actually, um, I can actually uh, measure regret against uh, any linear model in a d-dimensional uh, linear space. The only caveat is that uh, the gradients have to be bounded. Okay, if gradients are not bounded, uh, uh, things don't work. Uh, by the way, this is a way with which you can analyze algorithms uh, to solve the support vector machines uh, using a stochastic gradient descent like Pegasus. They actually borrow the online analysis from here because uh, the, the uh, support vector objective is strongly convex, okay? And then you have a, a more exotic notion of uh, convexity. It's like uh, you have a strong convexity, but not uh, in all direction, but only in direction of the gradient. And uh, square loss for bounded uh, uh, predictions and uh, labels are, is exactly of, of, uh, has exactly this property and also logistic loss has this property. And in this, so these functions are not strongly convex, but they are more than convex. So they are in between. 
and you can use a fancier algorithm that are sort of a more a, a more generalized version of online mirror descent. They are variants of the family of online mirror descent, and they are able to deliver this uh, uh, good regret bounds, logarithmic in time, even if the loss is not uh, is not strongly convex. So that's uh, still convex, but it's much faster that you have uh, for generic convex losses. So you have the whole, uh, you know, the whole uh, uh, business of exploiting curvature of a loss, which you have in convex optimization. You can transfer it to uh, to this uh, to uh, online convex optimization, and there's a lot more uh, than that. You can have acceleration. You, you have different things, uh, phenomenon that I'm, I'm not uh, going to uh, dwell because I have no time. Uh, Okay, just let me say a very few words, another notion of regret. So some of you may be disappointed because I started by saying, hey, online learning is useful because streams can be highly non-stationary and I can deal with non-stationarity. But then at the end of the day, I always define regret with respect to the best fixed model in my model class. So what if actually there is no such good single model in my model class that achieves a small cumulative loss, okay? So the C and no single minimizer in my model class is good because I have such a highly non-stationary data sequence that maybe, you know, things are, no single model is gonna perform well on that stream. So I should generalize regret and define regret with respect to the sequence of models. So now I want to compete not against the fixed model, but against the sequence of models. So now this looks incredibly tough. So there must be a way to parameterize my bounds in order to avoid the situation in which my models are just, you know, the uh, point was minimizer for this single loss. Then I clearly, it's clearly hopeless. Unless, you know, there must be some additional property here. And so I, I, what happens is that you can introduce a, a complex a complexity parameter, which is the distance traveled by the sequence of model in my model space, measure it according to certain norm. Typically, this is done in the case of Euclidean norms. So I can prove a lower bound, which is similar to the, you see, you have this d squared parameter inside the square root, and then you have the d the square root of t parameter. Lipschitz is one here, so there's no Lipschitz constant, just I'm assuming that. But then I have the appearance of this complexity parameter, and by using constructions, yeah, when this goes zero, this reduces to the standard lower bound. Oh, the Lipschitz is zero, sorry. And uh, using uh, fancy constructions that uh, have, uh, OG is like two tier constructions in which you have online gradient descent in the bottom and hedge to uh, hedge for the experts to aggregate these instances of online gradient descent. Uh, this uh, lower bound can be matched, uh, you know, tightly. So I can actually deal with this uh, uh, with this uh, machinery. I can really deal with no stationary, highly non stationary sequences that are really that are non stationary in a in a non stochastic sense. Okay, I would like to stop here to avoid uh, to leave enough space for questions, enough time for questions, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks.